Welcome back, everybody. It is time for another edition of Silver and Black today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. Hi, everybody. I am Scott Branson, your host, joined by my co-host, Mr. Mo Moten. Mo is a senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report, also Raiders columnist at SportsNot.com. You can follow him on X.com at Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. You can catch my work covering the Raiders. Excuse me. As well, I got choked up there. <laughs> no, uh, you could cover. You could see the work I cover on Sports Not as well, and follow me on X.com at LV Gully. The show is SNB today. Do us a favor if you don't already subscribe, get out there and do it wherever you get your audio. Uh, the numbers, even though it's off season, are picking up. So thank you so much for the incredible response, and on YouTube as well. Subscribe, hit the notifications bell, and the thumbs up. And a hearty hello to our folks in the chat over there. Okay, Mo, here we are. We, we're post-draft now. We had time to digest it, got some good feedback from people. Uh, and as expected, there's always 10% of people who like nothing. Some people I heard from <laughs> didn't like the Raiders draft because they didn't get a quarterback, including our, our old friend uh, Evan Grote. Uh, and it's still a point. Well, they'll address it. They'll figure it out. Uh, Vic Tafer had a nice piece, I thought, in The Athletic this week about, hey, the Raiders are going Band-Aid at quarterback, and maybe that's not a bad thing. We talked a lot about that the last show, so we're not going to spend a ton of time on it, but that's sort of what you know we're hearing from people. Uh, but I do look at the Raiders. They signed Michael Gallup from the uh, excuse me Dallas Cowboys, wide receiver who had, of course, a couple great seasons, then had a knee injury and has kind of fought his way back. I look at Michael Gallup, Mo, and I say, boy, if they can hit – uh, gold on him like they did, let's say, when Nelson Algalore came over when John Gruden was here. Uh, if they can get Michael, uh, if they can get Michael Gallup to be 85 percent or 90 percent of the receiver he was uh, in Dallas after that knee injury, then um, boy, I think that's a, a nice little signing for this team to bring in another veteran at, at wide receiver. And let's remember, Michael Gallup was a decent prospect. Uh, coming into the NFL, was, I believe, a third-round pick. Yes. And I, I think within his first couple of years, he had 1,100 yards receiving. Now the Dallas Cowboys wind up drafting C.D. Lamb in that Henry Ruggs, Jerry Judy draft. If you remember, Raider fans are trying to decide which was the best wide receiver for them. <laughs> uh, you know, C.D. Lamb goes to the Cowboys and then it kind of pushes Michael Gallup down on the depth chart because they, are, they also had Amari Cooper. Right. So – he became wide receiver three, but he was an effective wide receiver two, three uh, when C.D. Lamb came in the picture. As you mentioned, he did have a knee injury towards ACL at the end of the 2021 season, lost his momentum, didn't really find his way into a bigger role because other Cowboys pass catches emerged. But this is a solid pickup for the Raiders because, as you as you, as a lot of Raider fans said, it's a it's a low risk, high reward type of move <laughs> where you can get a wide receiver who can get you six to 800 yards in a season and, and a handful of touchdowns. And you're not paying a whole lot for him. I believe $3 million on a one year deal. That's, that's exactly what I said. I, I when I wrote the quick little piece for sports, not about the, the transaction was that, boy, this is, this is high reward, low risk. I mean, it's a one year deal. And if he does great, fine. You know what? And I like Mo, you start to look at this and we're going to get into some of the more of the roster building in this segment, by the way, coming up next segment, preview the show Chip Towers from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution will join us. He covered Brock Bowers during his career at Georgia. So we're going to get in some insight there from uh, Chip, who's a, a veteran newspaper reporter columnist. He's a great dude, so we'll, we'll be talking about Brock Bowers. And then we get to your calls. Of course, it's Thursday, so we're going to get to your calls in the final segment here on Silver and Black today. But I like – I mean, you start to look at this offense now, and really – and I'm not going to belabor the point. I know some people want to, and you and I have been very clear on this show – the quarterback thing, we kick the can down the road, that's fine. But the rest of this offense and what they've done in the draft and what they've done in free agency thus far, they've, they've, they're, they're, they have the line getting better. We'll see what happens at right tackle. Thayer Mumford, as you mentioned before, that this coaching staff really likes him, apparently. They, they're convinced that maybe he might be the guy. And then they got DJ Glaze there as a developmental project, I think, to get there and eventually maybe take over. We'll see what happens. And then, of course, you got JPJ at the right guard, which is going to be a, a stalwart there. He's going to be there forever. Oh, by the way, he does. He is such a good center. He won the award for being the best center in college football. So if you ever need to move him over, he's versatile. I think we forget about that sometimes. But um, you look at that offense, and, man, I'm like what they're putting together. We're going to talk here now about what 
the Raiders need to do to still address some needs on the roster. And one of those things, I think, even though you have Zeus back there, and of course, Chip, who's going to talk about Brock Bowers, also covered Zeus at Georgia. They were teammates, remember? But if you look at this situation, uh, I think the Raiders, even though they have Zamir White, even though they drafted Dylan Lobby, and, and they have a couple other guys there, I still think, though, that they need a couple uh, guys to come in and compete. Just see who wins out. Like, I, I had an argument on our show last time in the YouTube chat. Mo, people were telling me, oh, without Josh Jacobs, we're not going to be anything. I'm like, no, you don't have to have a superstar running back. The, the, the Chiefs won the Super Bowl two years in a row with a seventh-round pick at running back, okay? Isaiah Pacheco, by the way. So looking at that, though, you have a story up on Sports Not today about – about Tom Telesco and running back. So if we start to think about what they might do at running back, what kind of running back does Tom Telesco bring in versus a lot what we, a lot of the guys we've heard Raider Nation actually asking for? Tom Telesco likes his running backs like I like my women. On the thicker side, Scott. <laughs> He he likes <laughs> he likes a nice wagon back there. Ooh. He likes he likes some he likes some bubble wrap. With his running backs on the on the backside, I'll say that. Uh, all of Tom Telesco's running backs, all of Tom Telesco's running backs. You can look this up if you don't believe me. All of his running backs that he's drafted, going back to with the Chargers, going back to 2014, 13, 14, all of them at least 5'10, at least 200 pounds. Oh. That's how he likes his running backs. If you are shorter than 5'10, if you weigh less than 200 pounds and you are a running back. Tom Telesco probably isn't going to draft you. You need some pudding if Tom Telesco is going to draft you to be one of his running backs. Even if you're a second or third uh, back, he's mm -hmm. going to need you to be a certain height and weight. Certain uh, GMs have height and weight parameters that they want. If you remember, Tom Telesco comes from the Bill Polian drafting strategy tree. So uh, Bill Polian talks a lot. If you listen to Bill Polian talk about drafting players, he talks a lot about height and weight parameters mm -hmm. and certain GMs have height and weight parameters for certain positions for certain times. There are exceptions for exceptional prospects, but it's very clear to me that at running back is not necessarily the speed that he wants. He wants a sizable running back that has a thicker build. And for the most part, I would say if you're drafting a, a, a RB two or RB three, got to be able to pass protect or catch out of the backfield. So Dylan Lowby fits the mold. He's about 5'10", 206 pounds. So he fits into that height and weight parameter uh, that that Tom Tlesco likes. So now we we know, and again, I'm not going to run awry of anybody that we love here. So if, if, Mo, is, if Mo was single, which he's not, <laughs> he's saying that if you were 5'10", 200 pounds, he would date you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but but no, I, and I think that's important because I th even we saw that during the draft period, right, Mo? And I get it because I look at players sometimes, I go, man, that would be a great guy for the Raiders. And I'm like, oh, wait, the scheme's not right. The style of play is a little He's a great player, but he's he doesn't really fit in. And I think that's the important thing. And I think we've all been in that position, too, in our lives where you go interview for your job or something. It's a good job, but then you kind of get inside, you meet the people. And they might be fine people, but you're like, this is not, nah, it doesn't feel like this is the right place where I'm going to be able to succeed. So I think when the running backs, you, you hear a lot of these names thrown around. Oh, what about so-and-so? What about so-and-so? And it's like, nah, that's not how it's going to be. And I think the one thing, and I told people multiple times leading up to the draft to read your piece on the history of Tom Telesco's drafts, because you write, you found patterns, Okay. You were like a beautiful mind, and you're seeing all the numbers, right? And you're like, hey, this is what the guy – look, you have a track record. This was not Dave Ziegler who had not done it on his own yet. This is Tom Telesco who did it for 11 years with the, with the Chargers. So, so to me, that's something to do that. When you look, when you look at the open market right now, free agent-wise, from a running back perspective, there's still some veterans out there. Do you see anybody out there who could be a possibility and a good fit understanding what Tom Telesco likes and what the Raiders need? Not necessarily any big names that could be a good fit, but I, I could possibly see him going back into the running back market and maybe adding another guy for training camp. I know they have Amir Abdullah there. Mm -hmm. And also Sincere McCormick, I believe, maybe on still in the practice squad. I have to take a look at that. But I could see the, the three running backs being Zeus, Zamir White, Alexander Madison, and Dylan Lowby, because I expect Lowby to have an, an immediate role as a pass catching uh running back on third down. He is a really, he actually is a really good for a running back, a good route runner. 
You know, there are yes. some running backs that just leak out to the flat. You just throw them the football. He can actually run routes. He can actually line up in the slot. So he's an he has he's a running back with wide receiver hands, I would say. And as, as long as his pass protection is fine, he's going to get on the field. So there's really not a big need for the Raiders to dip back into the running back market. But you know, Scott, before training camp, before these camps, you fill up the roster, you get maximum 90 players. So you give guys a shot and see how it filters out. But really quick, Scott, I will say that that is the reason why I didn't talk too much about Ray Davis and Bucky Irvin being drafted by the Raiders, because neither of those players fit the parameters that Tom Tlesco's likes ray davis is on the thicker side but he's he's i believe five eight five nine uh same goes for bucky irving he's a smaller speedy back doesn't fit the height weight parameters i believe about 190 192 so it, there was a i didn't i didn't hammer it and i should have and i did touch on it in my tom tesco pieces you mentioned that there is a pattern with tom tesco running backs and he definitely stuck to that pattern in this draft class with dylan lobby Yes, and that's why I know you guys will joke with me about it because of my my Notre Dame bias, but that's why I thought Aldrich Estime would be a perfect running back. Yeah. 5'11", uh, 225, I mean, he would have been perfect. And and the kind of guy – and maybe he would have gone to the Raiders had he been there if the Broncos hadn't snagged him one pick before. Who knows? Uh, we'll see. But before we head to the first break and then we bring on Chip Towers after, after that break to talk about uh, Brock Bowers um, – Cornerback, too. I think that's still an area. They got some good young cornerbacks in the draft, clearly. But I do think they still need to maybe bring in a veteran to compete. Uh, and that's not a long-term solution. Again, I think that's, you know, somebody as somebody was criticizing Jack Jones to me the other day. Oh, he's a cast-off. I'm like, he did really well. He's going to be the starter on the one side. Um, you agree with me on that, that, that we'll probably see one or two of those cornerbacks come in with those expanded rosters in camp? Yes, and that's another thing that I wrote about in my piece. I hammered this point that I did. I just did not see Tom Sesco drafting a cornerback in the first round. Mm -hmm. Again, he only did it once in 10 years. So I was just like, I, I like Quinn Mitchell. I like Terry on his prospects, but the way Tom Sesco has been drafting, they're not going to be options in the first round. And lo and behold, he wasted the fourth round to Cameron uh, Richardson, drafts that cornerback. Now he doubled down on the position, MJ Devonshire in the seventh round. And I again, I want to say this again. I think Devin Shire is going to make the roster. I, not just because he's the last pick, but I think looking at his ball production, ran a four four five at the combine. I think he has a shot to make the roster. But I will say that I don't think the Raiders will depend on either of those two guys solely to start because Tom Tesco has a history of going into the veteran cornerback market. And as I told someone on X, Stephon Gilmore is still available. Adoree Jackson, who played under Patrick Graham with the Giants, still available. Xavier Howard, who played under Patrick Graham briefly before injury in Miami, still available. Steven Nelson, who I really like as a schematic fit, still available. So there mm -hmm. are some quality cornerbacks still available that could start right away for the Raiders that they could sign in the next few weeks. Yep. No, absolutely. And I expect them to do that. I think there's a lot of things uh, at work here. All I know is that no matter where you're at, I understand some people disappointed about the quarterback situation, all that stuff. Raiders got better. And that's the key thing here is when you look at what they were able to do, not always sexy, but definitely needed and definitely addressing issues within the roster and what they needed to do to get to be better in 2024. Okay, we're going to take our first break here on Silver and Black today. When we come back, Chip Towers from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution will join us. We're going to talk Brock Bowers. That's right, your new number one. Excuse me, pick. Man, I got. I got. I don't know what's going on with me today. You're emotional, um, Scott. That's all. I, 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 I'm terrible. Well, yeah. You even texted me yesterday about my face when you when we announced the Brock Bowers pick. It was it was pretty amazing. It was we were both like what what. So <laughs> thanks for the comments on that. But when we come back, we're going to talk to him about Brock Bowers. We're going to get to know a little bit more about him and uh, his career at Georgia, of course, which was stellar. But we'll get a little bit of inside information there from Chip Towers. You're with Scott and Mo. This is Silver and Black today. Don't go anywhere. No. Welcome back. Silver and Black today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast. Also heard on The Bet in Las Vegas, if you're listening to us on the radio. So thanks for being with us. This segment, we're going to be talking about Brock Bowers, the first-round draft pick of the Las Vegas Raiders. And to join Mo and I in that discussion, we welcome Chip Towers from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Covers the Georgia Bulldogs uh, down there. And uh, Chip, thanks for being with us. I mean, when Brock Bowers was picked, Mo and I were live on the air, and our faces kind of were like in shock <laughs> Not because, I mean, Brock Bowers, is, to me, was a top five pick, I thought. And so when the Raiders took him at a place that you didn't think they needed anybody because they were, you know, all the talk about quarterbacks, all the talk about offensive linemen, and then Brock Bowers hits. 
But you look at Brock Bowers and, and, and how much was coming out. Of course, he didn't work out at the combine because of um, some injury issues. He wanted to just do what he did. He was there. He met with teams. He impressed teams. But when you look at Brock Bowers and you saw him slip down to the Raiders, were you surprised by that? Well, no, not, not entirely. You, you know, tight end is, is such a funky position when it comes to the NFL draft. And, um, you know, I did a good bit of research on it, um, you, you know, in advance of the draft. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to bore you with, you know, you know, tight end analytics uh, <laughs> over the years, but it, but it is, it's, it's a hard position to pin down because, you know, not everybody necessarily accentuates the tight end. Um, you know, uh, right here, uh, you know, I, I work for the Atlanta Journal Constitution and, you know, the Atlanta Falcons took Kyle Pitts with the fourth pick uh, in whatever year that was, 21 or something like that. And, uh, you know, you wouldn't necessarily know it by his contributions on the field. But the flip side of that is you have guys like Travis Kelsey, Mark Andrews and and uh, George Kittle and, you um, you know, that w went later, but are, you know, tremendous contributors to their team. I, I, I heard Mel Kuyper in an interview talking about, he said, where would you draft those guys now? You know, Travis Kelsey. And I definitely think Brock Bowers is a guy who deserves mention with all those guys, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, he's, he's an incredible player. And I, you know, I, it's, it's typical NFL draft. You know, I wasn't really even thinking about the Raiders and him at all. And I, you know, I don't think the Raiders were really thinking about him a whole lot. The The draft is what it is. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming I, I actually feel like I have more questions for you guys than you might for me. I'm like, I'm assuming they were looking at quarterback. Uh, and then who knew you'd have a run of six in the first 12 picks. So I imagine they, they kind of, you know, like, Oh wait, I mean, even the Falcons might've, they might've thought that, uh, that their guy may be available that the Falcons snatched up. So it, it, you know, the, the draft is crazy, but let me, and I, this is why I'm on here. I mean, I think the Raiders got a great player. Uh, you know, you can talk to Mel Kuyper and all the different uh, draft analysts where they had him ranked on their boards. You know, when you beyond position, just NFL caliber player, you know, I've seen him, you know, in the top five. I don't know if he should be one or two. I have no questions that personally that Brock Bowers will be, uh, you know, all pro eventually. And, and you know, dare I say, Hall of Fame. I, I mean, I may be missing it, but I, I think he's that kind of player. Uh, and So I think they made out like bandits. And now just if somebody can get him the ball and look, they – you don't have to throw 25, 30 yard aerials down the field into double coverage. That's what's great about Brock Bowers. Just get the ball in, in, into his hands in a little bit of space, and he'll do the rest. Chip, it's funny you mentioned Brock Bowers being a Hall of Famer. I don't think you're going too far with that because over at my employer Bleach Report, as you can see behind me, we had him as the number two prospect behind only Marvin Harrison Jr. So we yeah. thought he was special as well. So I'll ask you this. A lot of some Raider fans didn't love the pick, obviously, because it wasn't a quote unquote need. But I think if you're labeling Brock Bowers as just a tight end, I think you're doing him a disservice because he lined up a lot in the slot and you can do a lot of things with him. It could be a mismatch nightmare on the field. Yeah. Talk about why he may not just be a tight end and more of a positionless player who's an offensive playmaker. Well, that's the thing. I mean, yeah, you you really do uh, Brock Bowers a disservice when you refer to him as a tight end because, I mean, he's uh, uh, he, he's that and everything else. You know, I mean, he's H-back, he's fullback, he's running back. He, he did all those positions while he's at Georgia. He's a great wing back, you know, from the standpoint of can, can run some of those counters. And um, – I don't think he gets enough credit for this. Uh, Brock Bowers is a devastating blocker. And um, and that's where I think, you know, uh, it's interesting. You got Zeus out. We call him Zeus Zamir White out there. And my understanding on offensive coordinator Luke Getze, now, I'm looking down here at my notes, right? I don't, I, I don't really know all that much about him, but I understand he's a, a run first guy. You know, I mean, he likes to run. He likes to establish the run game. And I think this works wonderfully with Brock Bowers because he is a conflict, a human conflict. When he lines up out there, whether it's at the line of scrimmage or just off the ball uh, or out in the slot, which they do with him sometimes, um, 
he's a conflict about are they going to run that way or are they going to throw it to him or in, in kind of the uh the the RPO stuff that they're doing in college you know Georgia does that you know that's what Georgia does now they're people still think of Georgia's RBU but they're much more of a run pass option team and um and and Brock Bowers just uh, just keeps man you hate to be a star or a safety out there and you got to decide you know what you got to do cuz you can you can line up right over him and know they're going to throw to the ball to him, and that's almost an impossible task. You add in the thing, well, he may block me, he may block somebody else, he may start to block, and then that's one of the great things he does is the old chip and then and then pop outside, uh, and he may take it to the house. Now his speed is 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 great, uh, it's at the top, but it's just he has this uncanny ability a to catch the ball and B, to advance it. Uh, and that's what we saw as a freshman. Guys, we didn't – this wasn't like, uh, say, Darnell Washington, who's from from out there in Las Vegas. You know, he was a five-star, rated number one. I mean, you knew it, right? But Brock Bowers came here in 20 uh, in, in the COVID season, and he was ranked a four-star, but you really didn't know that much about him. I didn't know that much about uh, – Brock Bowers until Georgia opens the season against Clemson in a big game and he's starting, you know, over Darnell Washington. I was, I was like, oh, wow, they're starting the freshman. You know, what's this all about? And then pretty quickly you're like, oh, wow, that's what he's good. You know, he's really, really good. So uh, he's been incredible to watch and, and he's a pretty good guy too, as you guys will learn uh, off the field. Yeah, and that was going to be my next question for you, too, because obviously you can see how well he does on the field and and why he's such a mismatch all over the place, which clearly the Raiders saw at 13 and said, wow, if this guy's standing here, we're going to take him because they I need help because they have they have an unsettled situation at quarterback, right? They don't yeah. have what I would consider a true franchise quarterback, so they need somebody who can help, and, and he's the perfect tool for that. Uh, but when you talk about Brock Bowers off the field too, you know, as someone who's been around and worked in college athletics, that's the thing, the difference between covering pro sports and covering college sports. You get to know these young men, and you see them mature over time. Talk a little bit about Brock Bowers – in that big freshman year, like you said, that opening up against Clemson, what you're surprised by him starting. And from that time until now, where he gets drafted 13th overall in the NFL, what did, what did you notice and what, what do people need to know about Brock Bowers as a young man? Well, the, uh, the unfortunate situation with, when it comes to Brock Bowers, which was the timing of all that, like I said, COVID. Uh, you know, I, I covered the University of Georgia, which is Kirby Smart, which is the Nick Saban model, right? And so <laughs> you don't talk to freshmen. And that, that's always frustrated me like crazy. He, it, it, you're starting to see evidence of that getting relaxed a little bit here in the age of NIL. If you're a freshman and you're contributing all the time, you know, you should be available for any media opportunities they, they are. And, you know, so from our selfish standpoint, you know, he's coming out of the 2020 recruiting year. So normally I would fan out. I used to do these, uh, uh, these series called Next Generation Story. And, you know, a guy commits to Georgia from Napa, California. Hey, I'm going to get on a plane and go out there and meet him. But that wasn't the situation with Brock. I didn't get to meet him. And like I said, then he's out there and he's playing against Clemson. And, you know, guys, he went house. I mean, I think in the second game, you know, with just a, a little tight end screen and he took it 80 yards in his freshman year. And it's like, wow. I mean, he is really fast. He just outran some defensive backs on that play. Uh, and that kind of stuff. So you, you really didn't know as much about him uh, as you would like to know. Now, the other side of him, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't want to speak for Brock. But, you know, he's probably not going to have a podcast out there. You know, he's not <laughs> he's not real chatty. He's not Travis Kelsey. He's not going to scream in a microphone when you, uh, you, when you hand it to him, you know, and it, it pro you're probably going to say, turn it up. Can you turn it up a little bit? Because he's really – He's all about football. You know, he's the son of a, a offensive center and a softball pitcher uh, from Utah State. He is nothing but uh, athleticism, loves the game, and, um, you know, a lot of yes, sir, no, sir, and, and um, 
you know, very <laughs> mild mannered. He may grow out of that a little bit in in the NFL, and we all kind of chuckle. Oh, he's going to Vegas, huh? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, what's he going to do? Uh, uh, you know, run down the strip, do strip, uh, do do <laughs> sprints down the strip because that's the kind of thing he is. He he's like very competitive every rep and every practice. And Georgia had he had some good tight ends when when he first came here, and there's some, he left some good tight ends. And I don't want not one of those guys ever beat him in a practice rep. If you believe what they say, uh, you know, inside the Georgia camp. So, Chip, we know all about his production on the field. First time yeah. John two time John Mackey Award winner. So yeah. he has that on his resume. He talked about produ the production that he has on the field. And I felt like with the Raiders draft, they drafted Brock Bowers, and he fits the mold of what AP wants and Tony Prince, the head coach. He wants a physical but smart football team. Not a physical but reckless one because you don't want the penalties on the pro level or any level of football. But I think Brock Bowers fits that mold, and I'm glad you mentioned his blocking because it was a misnomer out there that he isn't a good blocker. And I think his blocking mm -hmm. it was underrated just because he's a pass-catching tight end. Now, does he fit yeah. that AP mode where he's a physical football player, high IQ, going to do the right things on the field, avoid those penalties? Is he that type of player for the Raiders in AP? Yeah, uh, frankly, you know, I, I think that's why he ended up starting so much uh, ahead of Darnell, not to criticize Darnell or anything like that. But he just had early on a very uh, strong, broad understanding of the system. And look, you know, he also benefited from the fact that he came at the same time that Todd Munkin came is offensive coordinator, who I believe shares a lot of the philosophies of Luke Getze um, from the standpoint of he he likes to keep the defense and run past conflict. And what made Bauer so good at that was was disguising all that, you know. So, I mean, if, if, if you lined up him and Darnell Washington, which Georgia did a lot of times side by side, you know, Darnell Washington is, is six foot eight and, and, and he's and with long arms and he's going to get your arms on him. He's going to be a better blocker, but what what Brock gets you is you're 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 surprised by the fact that you're getting blocked because you got to be so focused on he has wide receiver speed. You know, it's 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 a legitimate four or five. I don't know what he ran in the combine and everything else. And and guys, man, is he tough? I mean, he came back in 26 days from tightrope surgery. I don't know if that was a good idea. I mean, I couldn't believe they played the rumor heading into that week. I can't remember which I think it was a Missouri <laughs> game or something late in the year was that, Hey, Brock Bowers is practicing this week and he's going to come back for this game. And I'm like, no, nah, no way. And they're like, uh, somebody, you know, uh, uh, uh tongue below or somebody came back in, in one month. And I said, yeah, but, hey, you know, that's a quarterback. This is, this is tight end, man. He's got to be driving. He's got to be blocking. No way. Dang, if he didn't come back. And um, I think he might have rushed it back. But, you know, he's a team first guy. And, you know, he knew that Georgia needed him out there. So, anyway, back to it. Uh, this is a guy that has a high level of comprehension when it comes to uh, zone versus man versus, uh, you know, the, the hot read, right? Because, uh, uh, you know, you may do one thing based on the coverage and you may do another thing based on the coverage. He mastered that as a freshman. So I think he comes to Las Vegas as a very sophisticated offensive player. Uh, and you have to be, you know, when you're that multidimensional, you think about what you got to process uh, to get ready for the season. Now he's going to have, you know, all new terminology and everything with the Raiders. But I think clearly he's capable of doing that because he did it as a true freshman at Georgia. Yeah, and I know a lot of the a lot of the fans down there call him Superman. That's how that's how they look at him because he's able to do mm -hmm. pretty much anything. When you look at Brock Bowers, though, as he transitions into a professional player, Chip, what what things is are out there that he can work on that you maybe noticed uh, throughout his career that he's maybe improved, but when he gets to the NFL level, he's going to have to take it to the next step. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's really tough. I mean, <laughs> you know, right? I mean, it, that's that's the thing. I think that's why. Uh, so many NFL types, you know, look, and in, 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 in the league, you know, positions have value and tight end just doesn't, you know, hold the value as a lot of the other positions, though. Again, I, I do think he's multi-positional. This is not a uh, inline tight end. It's always going to be on the right or the left and, you know, and, and is going to block or run a square out. Mm -hmm. You know, that is not the case here. So there is not a ton I think he needs to improve on. 
maybe, I mean, this is not really, I'm, I'm sort of making something up here. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, he, he had a couple of fumbles, uh, you know, in his career, in his you know, career, yeah. considering the times that he's kept it. I mean, he'll, he'll get the ball out there a little bit wide, you know, as he's, as he's trying to run, cause he's thinking of every yard. Um, but uh, he's also very fundamentally sound. I I have a hard time finding any criticism of it. I, I'm I'm eager to see uh, you know what his flaws are. And listen, you know he was able to be at six foot four, two hundred and forty pounds, physically dominant in the SEC, right Amazing. in college football. That's not going to necessarily be the case in the NFL. You know he's going to be uh, mano a mano a lot more. There's there's going to be uh, edge players that are able to to hold him up at the line of scrimmage. There are going to be safeties that are able to run with him. Um, yes. So you know, I would say you you know catching the contested ball is, is going to be more of a challenge for him. But you know, I mean, he came through with flying colors in that regard uh, all the time at Georgia because the last two years after his freshman year, I mean, he was option A. Again, I go back to Georgia's considered RBU, but after that freshman year, everything started and ended with 19. Where is 19? That's what the defensive quarter, uh, coordinators are saying. Have they established what number he's going to wear with the Raiders yet? 89. 89, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, so I, I, I think right out of the box, you know, teams trying to defend the Raiders, they're going to be, where is 89? And that obviously opens up everything for everybody else. Uh, and, and so I think that's what he brings to the table. So mastering that system, whatever it is and how, uh, how much differentiation there is between that, and what they're doing at Georgia will be his biggest challenge out of the box. Nice. Well, Chip, listen, we appreciate you spending so much time with us to help us get to know Brock Bowers. I know Raider Nation's very excited about the kid and to hear, uh, the stories about how dominant he was and watching him too, like you said, in the SEC and you saw how many kids from the SEC, especially defensive back, were taken this past draft and past three drafts, actually. You know he's going up against the best competition. By the way, you can follow Chip on X.com at CTowersAJC if you want to keep track of what's happening down in the SEC. Chip, thanks so much for being with us here on Silver and Black today. You got it. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, we're going to hit on to our break. When we come back, it's time for the Raider Nation mailbag. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. It is time for the home stretch here on Silver and Black today, the Thursday edition, which means it's time for the Raider Nation mailbag. We're going to get to your voicemails. But just a quick couple notes, Mo. That Great. Uh, appreciate the time that Chip Towers from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution gave us to talk about Brock Bowers, a kid he covered his entire time at Georgia. So he knows him well. He s saw him play every collegiate game that he played. And uh, when we were in the break, you were talking about it because we heard from a lot of Raider Nation, he can't block. And what did Chip say, Mo? Said he was a great blocker. <laughs> and as I said on the day of the draft, and I said this on my Bleach Report Live this past Sunday, it wasn't a question is, is if he is a good blocker. It's can he do that on a pro level at pro his level. size. Exactly. Now, as I, as I mentioned with Chip off air, he's probably going to have to put, put on 5 to 10 pounds of muscle just to make sure he can hold up his blocking assignments when he has those assignments with the Raiders. Yeah, absolutely. And so good stuff there. And I hope you guys enjoyed that because you get to little, get a little to, to know Brock Bowers a little better, know that he's not mm -hmm. going to be uh, the vocal kind of Max Crosby kind of player. He's going to be a quiet guy. I mean, you look at the, the history of the Raiders. Dave Casper was that way. Dave Casper still as an older man, and on gone into his profession is a quiet guy. He doesn't do a lot of interviews. They just go out, they work hard, they're really smart and they get the job done. And I'm I'm so excited about him because I think people and he and Chip hit on it so well there, Mo, that he is not a tight end like you think of a tight end. Yes, he's listed as a tight end, but he plays so many more positions. And this is why it was, in retrospect, as much as we were shocked, a really brilliant decision and lucky for the Raiders that he was there at 13 with the situation they have with their offense right now. Absolutely. And I think when you look at Brett now, if you remember what Chip just said, the Georgia basically ran their offense through him. <laughs> so as as, as 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 long as he's getting targets, he should he should have immediate production as a rookie. Now you you kind of hinted at this, and I've talked about it too, that it's on it's gonna be on Luke Getsy to use him properly. Because you heard what Chip said, he has you know Hall of Fame potential. 
And when I said it on, on the Bleach Report areas, when I said it here on Silver Black Today with you, a lot of people thought it was hyperbole. And I yeah. and again, this is a guy who covered Brock Bauer's collegiate career. He's saying it could be a Hall of Famer, all pro within a short period of time. The Raiders, yes. if they if they get him on the field and they use him properly, adequately use him, not just a tight end, a mismatched nightmare who can get you maybe 700 plus yards, can get you a bunch of touchdowns. He's going to be an immediate playmaker on that offense. Right. And and the important thing there, too, is with the Raiders, and this is why it's so big, with the quarterback situation and where it is and the quarterbacks that you do have that are not the most mobile guys. You don't have you don't have a guy like Jaden Daniels or anything like that. So if that's the case, then you need to have as many weapons as you can so that that quarterback can get rid of the ball. You've increased and, and improved your offensive line, so that should help give those guys more time. But now you add in this wrinkle, and, oh, boy, I tell you what. And then, like you talked about earlier, Dylan Lobby running back on third down. Boy, you're going to have – the quarterback's going to have so many opportunities to get rid of the ball and move the stick, so that's a very good thing. Okay, it's now time – to get to your calls, it's time for the Raider Nation mailbag. Uh, and uh, we're going to get right to them because we got a bunch of them. So here we go. Hey, Scott and Mo, it's Dominique from the Show Me. How you guys doing? Overall, I must say I'm very happy with the draft. I uh, give it a B. Plus. Uh, the only picks I weren't too crazy about uh, DJ Glaze um, and then the running back, Dylan Lowby. Now, instead of Lowby, and I don't hate, you know, I don't hate him, but instead of Lowby, me personally, I would have drafted the SEC's leading rusher uh, from Mizzou, Cody Schrader. Um, Lowby, to me, he's more of a just a receiver, more than a running back. I think Cody Schrader is a better runner, and I think, you know, he can be – Maybe not as good as Lobby in the passing game, but I think it, you know, it'll still be all right. Um, but with that being said, I don't hate that pick. The only one I'm really not a fan of is DJ Glaze. Hopefully he proves me wrong. But other than that, man, I like the uh, cornerback Richardson. He's very athletic. Like you guys said, you know, it may take him a year to develop, which is fine, but I think that'll be a great pick. Uh, also, I really like Trey Taylor. Uh, I know he won the award for the best safety in college football. Uh, I really like that. He's got a huge upside. All the other picks are awesome. Um, Powers Johnson, I mean, nothing you can, nothing else you need to say about that. <laughs> Powers, he's an offensive weapon. Uh, so, yeah, I love the draft. And uh, thanks, guys. Appreciate you. Talk to you later. All right. There's Dominique in St. Louis. Called in before a, a long time viewer of ours so we appreciate it dominique for calling in but uh mo look i agree with him there too dj glaze was the only one that i felt like ah and i think dj glaze can be a good tackle and so maybe that's what they saw we talked about it earlier on the show they like theo mumford and if they think that mumford can start there at least for now then you have the opportunity to use Glaze in a substitution role, in a, in a, in a, uh, a rotational role, and get in the experience, develop him over time. So Dominique touched on something that I talked about with Lobby in the first segment, mm -hmm. in that I don't think I agree with Dominique. I don't think he's going to get a ton of carries. I think that's going to be mostly Zeus and Alexander Madison. Right. Where Lobby is going to get his uh, due is in the passing game. And as I said, he's a running back with receiver hands. He can run, again, legit routes. So that's going to be his role. Dominique wanted more of a running back, and I, I completely understand that. I also agree with Dominique when he talked about Glaze. And I, and I hate to say I didn't love the pick, but that was the one pick that I questioned with the Raiders was DJ Glaze. And not just because of the prospect overall, but because I felt like the Raiders should have added stronger competition at the tackle position for Mumford. Because DJ Glaze, while he's listed as a tackle and played left and right tackle at Maryland, he has some. He has some slow. He's not. A, he's not a foot speed guy, so he doesn't no. have that great lateral agility. So a lot of draft analysts talked about DJ Glaze is possibly moving inside to guard. So right. if he if he struggles outside at tackle with speedy uh, edge rushers and pass defenders, and he moves inside the guard, who's going to be the legit competition for? Thea Mumford, is it going to be Wagner? A lot of Raider fans are, are shouting out Dalton Wagner's name this offseason. I, I think there's a possible, strong possibility that 
DJ Glaze is not a tackle for the Raiders and that he's more of a guard. Uh, so that for me, that pick, they could have, in my opinion, I would have went with a true tackle with tackle abilities rather than a tackle who may have to move inside the guard. Right. Matt, Matt Goncalves was uh, from Pittsburgh, which I thought went a couple picks after him would have been a better pick for the Raiders because I think he's a guy who would have immediately come in and competed. I'm not saying he would have won out necessarily, but he would have competed as a true, and he does have a quicker base, a quicker feet. Uh, and so the, D, the, the G, DJ Glaze selection, I think, is going to be the one most scrutinized until we see what happens there. But they've put their bets on Theo Mumford. They just have. It, 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 really quick, Scott, it just was surprising because he's he's not really athletic. And usually with Correct. the zone blocking system, you need athletic offensive linemen. And he right. just isn't that. And that's why I think there's a strong possibility he moves inside. Right, which is why you don't mind giving a little on size in that scheme, right? You right. you don't you don't right. need the biggest guy. You don't need Trent Brown over there, but certainly if the guy can move and he's got good leverage and the hands and the feet, then it's a good pick. So maybe he'll prove us wrong. You never know yeah. what happens. But Dominique, we appreciate the call. Now we go behind bars with Pastor Mike. Yo, Scott Mo, it's Pastor Mike behind bars. How you guys doing today? Yes, I. Had to take a few days to really kind of digest this whole draft. Um, I was shocked that Penix went at eight to Atlanta. I mean, that was, to me, a complete reach because I thought at 13 he was a reach, too, if the Raiders would have drafted him. And then when we got to our pick, Brock Bowers. And I thought, what the hell? <laughs> What's that, man? I didn't know. But, you know, after thinking about it, after watching film, I love the pick. Um, second round, we got that kid from Oregon, just a mauler, Richie Incognito vibes from that dude for sure, man. <laughs> and um, I thought, I thought, I thought all in all, the draft was pretty solid. Um, we addressed issues, um, got the tackle as well in the third round, and picked up some defensive backs, um, and then that linebacker out of Ohio State. Myself, I'm a Michigan fan. <laughs> Not real. I'm a little adverse to Ohio State dudes, but um, with the exception of Jack Tatum, of course. But <laughs> this Eichenberg kid looks pretty good, and yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited. Can't wait for the the season to start. Um, we'll see what happens, and that quarterback competition with uh, Aiden O'Connell and the guard dog Gardner Mitchell. I'm excited. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. Just thought I would just give my two cents. And I'd like to hear what you guys think as well. You guys have a great week. Raiders. <laughs> there you go. Pastor Mike doing the Lord's work behind bars, uh, attending to uh, prisoners out in California. So thank you for that one. Uh, look, I think he, he expresses a lot of what everyone else has expressed uh, as far as this draft class goes. People are pretty happy with it. There's obviously for in different people's minds, different questions, different players. But overall, uh, I think I think Raider Nation is dead on with being excited about what they were able to do in the draft. I think Pastor Mike did a lot of what I see every offseason after the draft, with, with, especially with fans who don't like certain picks. They're like, oh, I, I didn't really like that pick or get that draft pick. And then they look at the player's film. They look at some things. <laughs> they do some research. And they're like, you know what? I like that pick. And he, he said that about the Brock Bowers pick. And I, and I Bring that up, not just because we had Chip Towers on to talk about Brock Bowers, but I remember when we were on live, Scott. They, I would say it would there was a mix of people that weren't happy with the pick. Yeah, it, I wouldn't say it was 50-50, but I would say there was about a third to 40% of the people are going, ah, tight end. I don't know about this. I'm not really on board with this pick. I don't know how to feel about it. And as, over time, you know, days pass. As I said, you do some research, do some looking at some film, and you're like, you know what? This could be a special player. I understand why the Raiders picked Brock Bowers at 13. Yeah. And uh, again, Pastor Mike, thank you. And of course, Chip Towers in the last segment. Uh, if you didn't listen to that segment, yes, go back and listen to it. And I think you'll be even more excited about it. All right. Now we go to Lonnie in Fontana, California. This is Lonnie. Hey, good morning, Scott and Mo. This is Lonnie from Fontana. I uh, just want to say, man, love the show. First time I've called. Nice. Um, so, listening to the, the, the draft episode and the, the kind of back and forth about the Bowers pick. And, you know, the, the <laughs> thought that crosses my mind uh, that uh, Raider Nation will, I think, uh, also kind of, you know, start to think a little bit about was 
granted there were some different pieces there, but how dynamic our offense kind of seemed to be with the Darren Waller type tight end in that in that mix. And so uh, I'm hopeful that that's what we're going to see. Um, but that aside, and, and I will say I thought the draft went pretty well in the sense of, you know, them after that first pick and kind of that, you know, quite frankly, shocker. Um, going and getting some positions of need. I mean, it seemed like we got some good players coming in, a couple linemen. We got a uh, safety that seems to be, uh, what, in the sixth round, I think it was, or something that seems to be pretty good. Uh, cornerback as well, so I was happy to see that. But I guess the question for you guys is, you know, I, I, I it's hard to think about, not think about uh, Tom Telesco and the Chargers and just sort of how underwhelming that Chargers team has been year in and year out. And he's been the GM there for quite a few years. And, uh, you know, um, just makes me kind of wonder, like, with this draft, is this like a, what a typical dope draft would have been? And uh, <laughs> with that, I mean, again, I I've always have hope. I'm, you know, just a completely fooled optimist about the Raiders year in and year out. But uh, that's kind of my question for you. I don't know if I even asked that right. But, <laughs> do, you know, looking at this entire draft, uh, do you guys feel like it's pretty standard in terms of Telesco? I mean, he didn't do any trades, which I know that was big talk moving into this draft. Was a some sort of, I think somebody mentioned it, there was no trades uh, ever, uh, ever occurred under his watch on draft day. And certainly we didn't see that again. But... Was this just merely like he just kind of went about his business, did his thing, and, uh, you know, filled what we needed to fill? And I'm hoping that, again, we, uh, you know, we can take this this and, and run with it. So, anyway, fellas, I appreciate it. Again, really enjoy the show, and uh, take care. All right, there you go. Lonnie in Fontana, thanks, man. And, yeah, uh, Tom Telesco in 11 drafts traded up only twice in uh, 2015 and 2016. So, yes, he's right there. But a couple of things, Mo, and I'll let you answer after this. But I just want to say, too, that if you look at what the Chargers did under Tom Telesco, like every GM, they have their stinkers. There's no question about it. But the Chargers not winning, I believe, was not necessarily because of a lack of talent. They had injuries. They had bad coaching. I mean, Brandon Staley was awful. I mean, you look at the last three coaches that the, the Chargers have been through, uh, and I don't know that you, you – I mean, look – GM's responsible for getting the talent on the field. The coach is, takes the talent and, and, and performs on the field. So, so I don't know. You, I'm sure Charger fans could give me a better answer because I, I don't follow them that closely. But if you did, I, it, the talent was there. They, that's why they were always disappointing because the talent was there and they could never win. Right. So I, I'll, to, to the question, to Lonnie's question, I will say that with this draft, what I noticed, Tom Susco compared to his Chargers drafts, as you mentioned, as as he mentioned on the call, stuck to his board, didn't trade up. So that's a Tom Telesco staple right there. He's going to be very patient with his, you know, with his draft board. He's one thing. The good part of that is you're not going to get panic out of him. Mm -hmm. He's not, you're not going to get a panic pick where it's like, oh, I don't know what to do. Now the player that I wanted goes to another team. He's not going to panic. He's going to follow his board. He's going to be diligent in that. And I think that's a, that could be a good thing. The other thing is, I was on Bleacher Report Live with a Chargers fan, and he said one thing to look out for with Tom Tlesco is that he's going to he's gonna roll the dice and take chances with third-rounders. He says third-round picks are either going to be <laughs> fantastic or awful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if just a quick example, Keenan Allen was a third-round pick way back when, right? So what he told me is that be mindful of Tom Tlesco's third-round picks. He will take chances in the third, fourth round, the middle of the draft with certain guys you may think, I don't know about that guy. So – Dominique, the first caller, said he doesn't know about DJ Glaze. I don't know about DJ Glaze. I'm a little questionable on him. That's probably one of the swings that Tom Telesco took on a player who we don't know exactly what his position is. One last point about Tom Telesco is that I wrote about this on Sports Night is that Antonio Pierce's influence is on this draft class. So the Chargers were more, were more known as a finesse team under Tom Telesco, soft against the run. I think it's a little going to be a little different with the Rays with Antonio Pierce in his ear because – you talk about the picks. Brock Bowers, physical football player. Jackson Powers Johnson, physical football player. Tommy Eichenberg, physical football player. So I don't think the finesse criticism is going to come up with his draft classes when Antonio Pierce is the head coach. 100%. Great call. Appreciate it, Lonnie. Uh, keep calling in, my man. Now we go out to Albuquerque. Hey, Scott. Hey, Mo. I want to say thank you guys for uh, all your 
your uh, your podcast on the Raiders. Uh, appreciate Mo having a realistic view of the draft and and uh, you know not uh, not giving us uh, puppies and butterflies. You know, <laughs> so uh, thanks. I just want to tell you guys a great job and uh, hope to hear some uh, good news about the free agents as well. If we can go over some free agents that you think are available that we might pick up. Thanks, man. Uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, Rio Raider. Thanks. Rio Raider. Okay, yeah, the name wasn't at the top. So Rio Raider there. Hey, just uh, we appreciate the call, man, and and uh, that's absolutely correct. I, I don't think – go ahead. Go ahead, Mo. What, what, one thing, quick thing I'll say about that is it is very hard to be a draft analyst or just an NFL analyst who breaks down the picks after the draft because every – not every fan, but a lot of fans think every pick is going to be a hit. And we, as we all know, every pick is not going to hit. Every pick is not going to be a starter. Every pick is not going to contribute. There are going to be some guys who just get cut within three years. There are going to be guys who maybe get traded, guys who just never make a contribution. So I, what I try to do is try to give a realistic view and not try to sell fans on, yeah, everybody's going to be great. Oh, A++++. plus plus plus. Now, you, now, some fans may have graded this draft class in A+. Plus and this, that's fine. I gave it a B plus because, as I said, I have questions about Glaze's position. Is he a tackle? Is he a guard? Does, is he going to have to move inside, even though all his experience is at tackle? The Cameron and Richardson, is he going to develop into something where he actually gets on the field? We know he has the physical tools, but can he develop the technicals to get on the field and play cornerback? Again, I'm a big fan of D, uh, MJ Devonshire. I think he gets on the field before the Cameron and Richardson. That's my, that's my bold take for the Raiders draft class. But, yes, every pick is not going to hit. You're hoping for the best, but you know with these rookies – Hard to tell what they're going to be in three years. Hard to tell. Yeah, I love Trey Taylor. I think he's going to make the roster. But we'll see. You never know. And by the way, evaluating drafts, you do it in the moment. And, and you're right, right, Mo. You don't know until these guys pan out or they don't. But I can tell you, if, if 10 years from now we look at this draft class and Brock Bowers, as Chip Towers told us he thinks he will be, if Brock Bowers is an all-pro multiple-year player on his way to a Hall of Fame-type career – and Jackson Powers Johnson is the same way or at least a pro bowler and plays 12 years at right guard, it's a successful draft. And, and you win. you got to win, of course. But um, that's that's how it comes down to. If you get two players that are career players on your club and are all pros, you win. everybody takes that because you win. Absolutely. All right. There we go. We appreciate uh, the call in there. Now we're going out to our good friend Tarek. We'll find out where Tarek is traveling this week. Something tells me it's an AFC city. Good evening, Scott and Mo. How are you guys? This is Tarek checking in with you guys from Baltimore. Baltimore. A little bit of a draft recap. Uh, I was taken aback by the Brock Bowers pick. Um, <laughs> Michael Mayer was one of my breakout candidates in year two. Didn't show a whole lot as a rookie, but I thought, you know, coming out of Notre Dame, I, I just he was one of my picks to be a, a impact player in year two. But um, And then Jackson Powers Johnson. I think both of those two uh, players are kind of – blue chip type players who are probably going to work out. And I'm excited about both of them. I thought Delmar Glaze was questionable because um, uh, he was your third pick taken. And I think there were a lot better uh, quality, you know, offensive linemen out there. I did like the Trey Taylor pick and I'm definitely rooting for Dylan Lowby. He's kind of a blue collar kid and uh, we'll see what kind of, kind of um, impact he makes, if any, but I think a lot of these guys are going to hopefully initially make a, an impact. Um, you know, on special teams, but, uh, you know, you can always make a case for best position, um, best player on your board as, as opposed to position of need. And I really do think that the Raiders expected Penix to be there at 13. And when he was taken eight, uh, by the, by the, uh, uh, by the, then I, I just figured that, um, it kind of threw off their plans, uh, when he was taken by the Falcons. So, um, I you know realistically for any team, the Raiders and any other team, I think uh, you, you know you have to revisit the draft in a couple of years to truly uh, get a feel for how these players panned out. Um, I'm glad we didn't force a late round quarterback pick like uh, Rattler. Um, it looks like we're going to roll with AOC or Minshew. I really do hope it's Minshew. I think he has more abilities. Um, let me know what you guys think. I'm looking forward to you guys' show, um, and I will talk to you guys later. Go Raiders! Bye. All right, there's Tarek. Uh, I get what he's saying there, and uh, of course about the quarterback. Yes, I mean we all know what, what what's what's there. It, would they have taken him? Who knows? Um, but I do think that uh, it worked out for the Raiders. I mean, look, yes, the quarterback situation we talked about it last episode is not solved. But what they have, they're rolling with it, and can they win with it? Yes. 
But as you said last show, Mo, you said, hey, look, you get everything else, everything else in the house in order. And then next year, if it's next year, you can go all in on a quarterback, either trade, free agent, or, or the draft. Absolutely. I think the Raiders right now are built for a quarterback to come in there and elevate them to the playoffs. Now, all they, now we'll see what Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew turn into this year. Or are, do mm-hmm. they elevate their games with the, with the offensive playmakers around them? But Tom Susco, to me, basically said, well, we didn't get a quarterback, but we put everything else in order. We got everything else around the quarterback that, that can help Aiden O'Connell or Gardner Minshew play at a higher level. So they may be, you know, bridge gap quarterback and a developing quarterback, but with the supporting cast around them, it could elevate the quarterback. Usually you expect your quarterback to elevate the players around them, but it could be the other way around too. I mean, look yeah. at Miami. I, I I know people like Tua Tunga Vailoa, but having Tyreek Hill definitely helps him. He was t- Tua was mentioned as an MVP candidate, and he stunk it up in that playoff game against the Kansas City Chiefs. But as soon as Tyreek Hill got there, he was elevated. Josh Allen in right. Buffalo, before, before Stephon Diggs got to Buffalo, Josh Allen was barely thrown for over 3,000 yards, 20 touchdowns. Stephon Diggs gets there, and all of a sudden he's a Pro Bowl player. Now we'll see what it looks like now without Stephon Diggs and Keon Coleman there, but your supporting cast of wide receivers and pass catchers and running backs and offensive line could elevate your quarterback, and that could be the case for Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell this year. Yeah, absolutely. Good call, Tarek. As always, we appreciate you, man. All right, now it's, of course, time for our friend Jacob in Fresno. Here's Jacob. Scott. This is Jacob from Fresno. What's up, guys? What's up, guys? Listen up. Uh, Brock Bowers, wow. Uh, <laughs> Jackson Powers, just wow. Uh, everybody else, a wow. I don't have time to talk about all, but come on, these guys. What did we do? It's like we flipped everything upside down. It's like we we looked at John Gruden and Mike Mayock picking, and we said, I'll "Tell you what, man, we're uh, we're not going to do that one again. <laughs> we need to clean up on all five of us that one." Anyway, John Gruden's gone. Good deal. Good for him. All success to you, John. You take it easy wherever you're doing whatever you're doing. Probably sipping margaritas at Margarita. I don't know. Anyway, we. <laughs> are going to the Super Bowl. No, I mean, well, we're, we're much better than we were before the draft. How about that? <laughs> Brock Bowers, wow, how is he there? How is he there? We got him. I don't care. JPJ, who, 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 wow, 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 wow. I'm telling you, maybe the best offensive lineman in the draft. He's not an offensive tackle, but come on. He's the, and the, I understand why he was there in the second round, but – Best offensive lineman in the draft, my opinion. Maybe not yours, but I love him. I love this guy. I'm so glad he's a Raider. He's a hard hat guy. He's a lunch pill guy. He is a punch you in the mouth guy and laugh guy. He is going to be boistering or swaggering boisterously and <laughs> knocking you down and upside down. I don't know. Out of that, I'm messing up the, the thing. But anywho, I don't have much time. i got to ask you my question. Quarterback, we didn't get anybody. Gardner Minshew. AOC, let me ask you the question. Is it really only between Gardner Minshew and AOC? Or is there the possibility that the young slinger Carter Bradley is going <laughs> to oh, come gosh. in Uh-oh. and steal that job? Jacob, or always mixing it up. Is Anthony Brown Jr., is he going to be the guy? Is he going to be the next great Randall Cunningham? <laughs> so to speak. I don't know. You guys tell me. I'm just trying to get happy. I'm trying to stay up, but I'm so happy about the draft. You guys take it easy. One more time. Peter and Nita. <laughs> Jacob and Fresno. Oh, I love Jacob. Some some of the listeners and viewers don't like Jacob because of his, his energetic calls, but I love him. If you, um, if you, if you woke up sleepy or if yeah. you're, you lacking energy, Jacob will, will inject some of that you. in you. He will get it for you. Uh, All but, no. you do, you guys, so. but Jacob, I, I look a lot of the stuff you said. Yeah, great stuff. But I do. I don't think for whatever reason, NFL fans doesn't matter the team. The third, fourth quarterback going into camp, everybody thinks, well, this is going to be the guy who who I'm telling you, he's going to be good. He's going to compete. He's going to do that. No, not going to happen. Scott, I went through this with Chase Garbers last year. Yes, remember, right. remember, 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 I, I, I went. 
I I went to battle with Chase Garber's yes. supporters last year who told me Chase Garber's was going to be the guy, right? Yeah. Yep. And I will tell you, you know, Carter Bradley, son of Gus Bradley, who was the former defense coordinator of the Raiders. Right. Good story there. Probably a camp arm. Anthony Brown, probably quarterback three, because as you know, you can have a third emergency quarterback now. So probably makes the roster as quarterback three. The battle is going to be between Aiden O'Connor and Gardner Minshew. Gardner right. Minshew, remember, they paid two years, $25 million, gave him $15 million guaranteed. He has the experience, nearly led the Colts to the playoffs. If C.J. Stroud wasn't otherworldly as a rookie, the Colts are in the playoffs with Gardner Minshew. And Aiden O'Connor, you saw he played well down the stretch last year. A lot of our listeners have pointed that out. So that's going to, that's going to be what it's going to come down to for the Raiders. Does Aiden O'Connell continue to improve, and does he show that as a developmental player last year? Does he make that second-year jump? Or does Gardner Minshew's experience win out, and he's able to get the Raiders in the playoff conversation, conversation as he had the Colts in the playoffs conversation last season? Absolutely. Yeah, went down to the last game, lost to Houston. That's the only reason the Colts weren't in the playoffs. Threw for thirty, oh, almost 3,400 yards. You know, hey. So we'll see what happens. But uh, thanks for the call, Jacob. Okay, our last call on this edition of the Raider Nation mailbag, i.e. voice mailbag. Oh, gosh. I, you know, I totally forgot, Mo. The number, if you want to call in next week, mm-hmm. 702-900-7869. I'll leave it up there for a while. 702-900-7869. It is in the description of the video and the podcast. And so are the links to the most recent stories by Mo. Concerning the Raiders, up on Bleacher Report or on Sports Not, and also mine on Sports Not as well. So you can you can go there if you want to see anything that has been written uh, by either one of us. So there you go. 702-900-7869 is the number. All right. Last call of the day is Jesse. And you remember Jesse from Arizona. I think I think he's from Arizona. I thought Jesse was female last week, so I I apologize to him again. I just had it wrong. So there we go. Call him Jessica. <laughs> it's it, you, Jessica. That's what I did. Yes. It's tough these days, man. You know, you, you never know. So we'll see. Okay, here we go. Here's Jesse, <laughs> I think in Arizona. Hey, what's up, Scott and Mo? This is Jesse, or should I say, it's me. I love it. Uh, this is Arizona. Hey, I'm calling because remember I called earlier? the week and i said the paraders are going to do something that we that's absolutely out of all of our control and they're going to do the complete opposite of what we think they're going to do and they yeah. did just that which is great honestly mm-hmm. whatever this time at least you know it was, it was brock powers and now i mean you know, now i'm calling after day two then <clears throat> they also selected uh jackson powers johnson which is also a great pick mm-hmm you know, Telesco is, is, is uh, drafting maybe not so much players of me, but I, all I got to say, man, is I, I'm not sitting here scratching my head saying, what the hell are they doing? <laughs> exactly. Who is this guy? This guy, they got round, you know, this, this guy has a, a draft rate of round two, and we took him with a 13th pick. Yeah. Uh, not, mm-hmm. not today, not this era. It's awesome, man. Mm-hmm. It feels great, whatever. We just bolster up that that offensive, um, the off the offense crazy with uh, with that tight end Bowers. He's gonna be a beast, man. So whatever, I'm cool with it. Sounds great. Anyway, just wanted to chime in and uh, make make some make some people laugh, and then also just <laughs> kind of you know, clear the air there that uh, I think Celeste still doing pretty good, pretty good job, man. Pretty good job. I was surprised FedEx went at 13. That, or I'm sorry, at eight. That was weird. Stockton's probably well, somebody's gonna get fired there. All right. How was it, man? Great nation. Out. There you go. Jesse in Arizona, not Jessica. I loved it, man. That was great. Jess, Jesse, was great. a.k.a. Jessica, calling in one another. Right. Jesse, <laughs> Good Jesse one. Jessica is his name from now on. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I mean, again, uh, everybody, I think, feels the same way. And that, and what he hit on there at the end, Mo, and you, you, were, saying, you were saying yes out loud, which was mm-hmm. the Raiders surprised us, as Jesse predicted. So give him props for that. Give him props uh, but for it that. wasn't a, oh, my God, what were they thinking surprise. It was a, whoa, whoa, that's a great player. Okay, fine, fit him in. So, Scott, even though we may question certain picks in the third or fourth round, Glaze, DeCameron Richardson, yeah. it's not like a pick where it's like, you know, where, what? You know, it's not a puzzling pick. It's just like maybe I would have drafted him a, a round later, at, yeah. you know, at most. So it, at, to Jesse's point, and I made this point as soon as they picked Brock Bowers, even before the shock, even while I was shocked, 
I said, this is not a Cleve Farrell pick. This is not picking Cleve Farrell at four. This is not picking Damon Arnett in, in the first round. This is not this is not um John John A Jonathan Abram in the first round. This is a surprising pick because this is a player that shouldn't have been available at 13. So they got Correct. great value for him. So you can't say, oh, they reach for this pick. Now, did they, no. they fill us a, a quote unquote need? No. But as we talked to Chip Towers about this. You can't label just label Brock Bowers a tight end for all he that he can do on the field. He's not just a tight end. I think Raider fans are eventually going to see that. But yes, to Jesse's point, his call. This is a new era for the Raiders. As I said, Tom Glasgow being hired, a lot of people were kind of iffy about it. The good thing about his experience is you probably won't leave your yourself scratching your head thinking, what direction are the Raiders going into? What right. did they do with this top pick, with this premium pick? Tom Glasgow has a plan. While you may disagree with certain parts of it. There's a sound plan there, and he's not going to overly reach for a player with a premium pick in the first or second rounds. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you to all the callers this week. Again, I knew we would have a lot of them after the draft. Keep them coming, 702-900-7869, as we end the show on a positive note. A great call there from Jesse. All right, Mo, we know you have your piece up today uh, that we talked about earlier on Sports Not. Let everybody else know what you got coming up uh, here the rest of this week. We're on Thursday. There's only a day left, but what you got that people need to pay attention to. So as I said, overall takeaways on Tom Telesco's first draft class with the Raiders. I touched on one of the points today about what he likes in running backs, same as I like my women. Uh, so check out that, <laughs> that Sports Not piece. Uh, dug into the numbers, dug into the players that he's drafted this year compared to previous years i will have a bleacher report live out whenever the schedule comes out because the nfl likes to keep it kind of secret when they're going to release the schedule uh whenever they do release the schedule i will go live immediately after and talk about my early prediction for the raiders how many games they're going to win and lose what are they going to end up at uh, at the end of the season in 2024 you may be surprised you may not be surprised based on my picks just remember last year when I made my picks, I was right on every Raider game that John that Josh McDaniels coached. I was 8-0. You were. And my predictions for Josh McDaniels coach games for the Raiders. So let's see how I do this year with Antonio Pierce. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to that when the NFL decides to let the secret. Well, how ridiculous <laughs> is that? Come on. But it's a business, okay. so they're trying to yeah. pinch every penny out of you that they can. Yeah. So we'll yeah. do that. But we will be back on Tuesday, uh, sans any big news that happens, which I don't see happening. But the Raiders will obviously go into uh, the, the mini camp. It will be May 20th, 21st, I believe it is, or 21st, 22nd, somewhere around there. So mm -hmm. we'll lead up to that. And I expect the Raiders to keep making some moves here and there, and we'll keep on top of that. Also, check out my work up on Sports Not. A couple pieces up, uh, one on Brock Bowers uh, on Sports Not today. Uh, that you can also see. You can read Mo's, and then you can read mine, and then you can just not read anything else. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but you can check it out. Be sure to follow the show on Twitter, SNB Today. Follow Mo, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at LV Gully. That's X, not Twitter, whatever you want to call it. But anyway, Mo, my friend, take care of yourself, and we will see you next week. See you next week. All right, for Mo, for our producer, Mike Rabier, I am Scott Branson. This has been Silver and Black Today. Uh, Odyssey original podcast and do us a favor make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcast and to our YouTube audience thanks for sticking around for a longer show today we will see you guys next week bye bye